In this video, we are going to be discussing the rules for naming ionic compounds and covalent compounds. We are first going to start by looking at ionic compounds. So, we already established that ionic compounds are going to be composed of a cation and of an anion. So, when it comes to naming ionic compounds, let's understand that when it comes to the cation, which is the left side of this flow chart, there are going to be two types of cations that can be formed in ionic compounds. The first one is type one metals. And as you can see, those are going to be the ones that I do with a check mark. They form only one type of ion. Where do we find type one metals? In group 1A. 2a, 3a, and in 3a, remember that on, that only applies to aluminum, gallium, and indium. Understand that when it comes to type 2 metals, those are going to be metal forms that form more than one type of ion. Now, when it comes to those, we find these in the transition metals. In other words, group B of the periodic table. And in addition to that, we also have four elements that undergo the same process. They are not in group B, but they are also going to be um, elements that form multiple charges. And those are going to be tin, antimony, bismuth, And lead okay they actually live in the P block but these four elements are also going to form multiple charges when it comes to naming as you can see the rules are established on the right side of this slide which we are first going to identify the cation or the anion and understand that in chemical formulas The cation always is written first. Then we're going to write the name of the cation by the element name, and that's going to be for your type one metals. Now, for type two, let's focus on this bottom part of the slide, because what happens for type two metals is that you're going to use, in addition to the name, so I'm just gonna move this here, you're going to do name of element, then in parentheses, you're going to use a Roman numeral. And what that Roman numeral is going to represent is the charge of the cation, as you can see here. When it comes to the name of the anion, you, as you can see, you're going to use the first syllable of the element of that nonmetal followed by the ending IDE. These we can find in table 6.1 of the textbook. And then you write the name by doing the cation first with the corresponding rules, depending on the type of cation you have, and then the name for the anion second. So as I mentioned a few moments ago, remember, there are some metals that have variable charge. As I already established on table 6.5, they only give you uh, a sample of some of the metals that have multiple charge. Now, let's go over an exception to the rule. And we have many of them in chemistry. This exception establishes that even though these three elements, zinc, cadmium, and silver, even though they live in group B of the periodic table, they do not form multiple charges. These 
only form one charge always. What does this mean? That because they, they only form one charge, okay, uh, at times you will see that the name will include the Roman numeral or sometimes the, the name will not include the Roman numeral. But that is only optional for these three. Let me just write it here. Only these three transition metals the Roman numeral is optional and it is because they only have one charge okay only those three now when it comes to the anions, remember that anions, in addition of the nonmetals, we can also have polyatomic ions. When it comes to the polyatomic ions, as you can see, this is going to be a group of atoms that have an overall charge. The majority of the polyatomic ions that you guys are going to be studying in this course have negative charges. It's either going to be negative one, negative two, or negative three. There's only one that it is positive. It is known as ammonium. Please do not confuse it with the covalent compound. Ammonia. which ammonia is NH3. Now, ammonium is made uh, from ammonia, but please do not confuse the chemical formulas for both of them, okay? And as you can see here, um, polyatomic ions are actually present in many substances that we have uh, used or at least seen in everyday life. So for example, plaster cast is made out of uh, CaSO4, okay? Which means that we have calcium and sulfate in it for example plant fertilizer is made out of ammonium and nitrate ion okay and this is the chemical formula so now um, let's proceed to which are the polyatomic ions that you should be concerned with so in the reference list this is what is present so I expect that the one that is in the gray box is what you guys are going to be responsible for knowing in the exam okay so no these if you're doing some textbook problems as you can see there's some here that are not included in the gray box so these you can utilize them for homework or practice problems from the textbook. So before I go over writing chemical form, well, let me just uh, go over this, the writing the chemical formulas. Because um, we have an example in the worksheet that we um, already practice and we need to deal with this. So um, before we go into naming, let's practice writing the chemical formulas for polyatomic ions. So as you can see, when writing the formulas for an ionic compound that, on, that on, contains a polyatomic ions, we can use the same rules that we used previously for, for simple ionic compounds. So when it comes to these, as you can see, the compound is made out of magnesium ion and nitrate ion. So what we're going to do is write the symbol of magnesium, okay, and the charge. Remember that it is plus two because magnesium lives in group 2A. Nitrate, you need to know that it is NO3, negative one, because remember, in this table, you need to know
the chemical formula, the charge, and the name. Okay? So it is your responsibility to know that nitrate is NO3 negative 1. Okay? So for example, this is nitrate, and this is the chemical formula. So going back to what we were doing, you will write nitrate. Now, similar to what we have done before, you're going to take the number, not the sign, and you're going to make it the subscript of the neighboring atom. So I'm just going to zoom in to look at it more closely. So as you can see here, the one, the value of one is going to become the subscript of magnesium. But again, because one is omitted, then we're going to delete it. And then, as you can see, the value of two is going to be corresponding um, to the subscript of NO3. So I'm going to write the note that when polyatomic ions have a subscript higher than one, a parentheses needs to be written in the value of the subscript is placed outside. So you can see here that because the subscript of nitrate is going to be two, we wrap it in a parentheses and the number two goes outside. Okay. So at this time, to practice these, we are going to go to this problem, okay? Now, as you can see here, oh, sorry, not that problem, this problem. So here, what we have is um, writing the chemical formulas for compounds that contain uh, polyatomic ions, which are E through H. Okay, and for these, I'm only going to do E and F to illustrate these um, chemical formulas. So when it comes to this, the first word, we're going to write the chemical formula, which is NH4, ammonium. And the charge of NH4 is going to be positive 1. Then we have phosphate, which is PO4. The charge for it is negative 3. So when we write the chemical formula for this, it's going to be NH4 parentheses 3 and then PO4 and then for those of you that are like wait how does she did that or how did she do that so the number 3 and the value of 1 are exchange between the two atoms so the 3 becomes the subscript of the ammonium the 1 becomes the subscript of the phosphate. That's how I get NH4 in parentheses 3, PO4. Let's do letter F. So for letter F, I'm just going to delete some of this work. So I can write it down. As you can see, we have iron, which is Fe. The Roman numeral 2 tells me that it is a 2 plus. Sulfite tells me that this is SO3, 2 negative. Okay. So at first, when I write the chemical formula, again, I take the value of 2 and 2, and I write it as the subscript. Okay, of each other, 
So you will say Fe2 SO3 2, okay? But because the twos are divisible, then you're going to divide this side by 2. You're going to divide this side by 2. So the final answer for this one is going to be Fe SO3. Another way to visualize it, similar to what I've mentioned before to you guys, by observing that this is positive 2 and this is negative 2 and that they will cancel each other. That's why overall you, we don't see a subscript here. That's another way to see it. Okay. So when it comes to this, let's now go over naming ionic compounds. Okay. So by now, you guys should take into consideration that we have discussed six different flavors for ionic compounds, okay? And they are the following. Ionic compounds, come as A, A type 1 metal and a non metal. They can also come as type 2 metals and non metals. We can have polyatomic ions. The only cation that we have is ammonium, and that can be combined with a non-metal. Okay? Now, we can also have type 1 metals combined with polyatomic anions. We can have type 2 metals combined with polyatomic anions. And lastly, we can have ammonium combined with polyatomic anions. Let me just put anion as singular because you can only have one as a pair, okay? Similar here, you only have one non-metal. So, how do we know how to name these? Well, if it's a type 1 metal, you're going to write name of element. For the non-metals, that's going to come from Table 6.1, okay? Type 2 metals is going to be the name of the element. And then you're going to have a Roman numeral for the charge. Ammonium. We just write the word of the polyatomic, which is ammonium. So this is name of polyatomic. And even if you have a polyatomic anion, when you're writing the name, it's just going to be the name of the polyatomic anion. Okay, so these are the rules for naming. So one of the things that I want to encourage you guys is to first define what kind okay, of ionic compound do I have? Because if you know what type of ionic compound you have, then it's easier to define what you should be doing. Okay. So for these, um, I'm just going to do problems one through five. Okay. Make sure that you continue practicing so you get good at this.
So, for example, if I look at number one, number one, NABR is going to be letter A for the type of compound, meaning I have a type one metal and I have a non-metal. And remember, the type one metals are the ones that live in group 1A, 2A, or 3A. So when it comes to this, again, for my type one metal, I write the name of the element. So this is sodium. And for Br, which is my nonmetal, if I go to table 6.1, I notice that bromine, when I write the name, is going to be bromide. Okay. Number two, K2S is also the letter A is going to be a type one metal nonmetal. So K is actually potassium. Because remember, for type one metals, we just write the name of the element. And for sulfur, I will write the word sulfide. Um, for number three, I have magnesium or Mg3N2. Okay, that is also like the letter A, which is name of element, which is magnesium. And then for nitrogen in table uh, 6.1, it says that that nonmetal is called nitride. For number four, I actually go into do up to six. For number four, as you can see, we have Ni and we have specifically Cl3. So this is going to be a type two metal, non-metal. So this is going to be like letter B, okay? Now, only for those, you need to break them into ions. So I'm going to do that in the top. Only if you have a type B, then you need to take your chemical formula and break it into ions. So this number three is going to go back to the nickel. This number one that is written here, but it is implied in the chemical formula, is going to return to its place in the chlorine. So when I break this into ions, I see that I have Ni3 plus Cl negative 1. So it is important that at this point you look at your Cl, okay, your anion, okay. If it has the correct charge, then you can go ahead and name compound. Okay. If it doesn't, then we have to do a little bit of more work. For that, I'm going to explain number nine. So when it comes to that one, CL lives in 7A. So because it lives in 7A, then it makes sense, okay, that uh, specifically, uh, Chlorine has a negative one charge, so we're going to name it based on the charge that nickel has. So that means that for that one, the name is going to be nickel three chloride. Okay. For number five, that's also like letter B. Okay. So for number five, if we do the same process, Cr2O3, when I break it into ions, this is going to be Cr3 plus O2 negative, okay? So this number went back to the chromium. This went back to the oxygen. These are my ions. Looking at that nonmetal, oxygen is always minus two, so I can name it. So this is chromium. three oxide okay and let's just do one more for fun let's just uh, do number six which is going to be where we have a 
type 2 metal in a polyatomic. So that's going to be like letter E. So when it comes to that, any time you have B, and as you can see, also for E, we have to break them into ions. This comes from the idea that we have. So whenever you have a type 2 metal, As your cation, you have to break it into ions. So for number six, we have Ni2 plus NO3 negative one, okay? So since NO3 is always negative one, we can go ahead and name it. This is nickel two nitrate. Okay, I want to go over one more example, which is number nine. So I'm going to erase this work that I did down here to explain number nine. The reason why I want to go over number nine is because number nine is going to be like letter E. That's going to be that flavor. When we have letter E, we need to break it into ions. So I have, if I have PV... C2O4 as a chemical formula. When I break it into ions, I will first determine that PB has a plus one, C2O4 has a minus one. Now, C2O4, which is oxalate, is never minus two. It's, not, it's never minus one, sorry. It is minus two, okay? So when it comes to this, you have to tell yourself, wait, minus one is not the correct answer. The correct answer for the charge of this is going to be negative 2. That means that the charge on PB cannot be plus 1, okay? Since we know that we have one oxalate and we have one lead, okay, the charge on that lead must be positive 2 to balance the charge. And all we're doing is multiplying the charge times the subscript. So this is positive two plus negative two, that equals zero. So these are the correct charges for our ions, okay? So that means that for number nine, the correct name is going to be lead two oxalate. Make sure that you practice naming ionic compounds. The last type of, co uh, of compound that we need to learn how to name is going to be molecular compounds. And remember that molecular compounds are going to be sharing electrons. They are going to be formed by two or more nonmetals that are going to be sharing electrons because of a covalent bond, okay? So to illustrate different types of covalent compounds, as you can see on the right side of the slide, we have different examples for covalent compounds. So make sure that you know the chemical formulas and names for common names for covalent compounds at the table three at the reference list. Let me just write it. for exam, okay? Now, let's go over um, naming covalent compounds, okay? When it comes to covalent compounds or molecular compounds, remember molecular compounds is the same thing as saying covalent compounds. We need to utilize a prefix, okay? So, 
whenever we have this, understand that a prefix is going to be utilized, okay, in the first element only if you have two or more at the subscript. For the second non-metal, understand that the prefix is always used. Okay? Always, always, always. Then, that second non-metal, even though it doesn't form an anion, we're going to use the name that is given for it in table 6.1. And again, for the first non-metal, I forgot to mention it, you just use the name of the first um, of the element, the first non-metal. Now, where do you get your prefixes? As you can see, they are summarized in table 6.12, okay? They are mono if you have one uh, atom, di for two, tri for three, uh, tetra for four, and then penta all the way to deca are just the Greek prefixes, okay? Now, understand that there's going to be something special when you have specifically oxide. So this rule applies to using oxide as your uh, second nonmetal name. So whenever we have oxygen as our second nonmetal, then we have to worry about this. What does this rule state? If you have a vowel that ends in O or A. So when we look at our um, prefixes, you can see mono, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nona, deca. Okay. When those that I uh, highlighted in blue combine with oxide, understand that we are going to erase that last letter, which can be O or A, as you can see in the highlighted atoms, and we're going to make one word. So to give you an example, let's say that you have CO as a compound, okay? For carbon, as you can see, there's no subscript, so we have only one. So you're going to write the name carbon, okay? For oxygen, we also have one, so you're going to select the prefix mono, and then oxygen, based on stable Table 6.1 is going to be oxide. Now, because the prefix ends in O and we have oxide in the next word, then we have to erase that O in the prefix and then combine it with the oxide as one word. So this is carbon monoxide. So, Let's actually practice some names for molecular compounds. I'm just going to do the first three. So as you can see, the first one, SO, this is sulfur monoxide. For the second one, this is carbon dioxide. And for number three, this is disulfur hexa fluoride be careful when you're spelling fluoride remember fluoride is f-l-u-o-r-i-d-e don't switch the o and the u just because when we say fluoride it sounds like the o becomes before the u but that's not the case it's u and then the o now Understand that when it comes to real life, you are going to be experiencing all of these uh, compounds all at once, all combined. And you have to remember all the rules that were discussed in this video. Okay. So my recommendation is if you have to solve a problem like this, okay, uh, in any type of practice or homework, the first thing that you do is identify if your compound is ionic or covalent. Why do I recommend that? Because if you know it's ionic, then you apply the rules for ionic. 
if you know it's covalent, then you apply the rules for covalent, okay? So, for example, I'm just going to do the first five. I'm going to identify which ones are ionics and which ones are covalent. I'm just going to highlight them. So, my ionic compounds, I'm going to highlight in blue. So, this is ionic, this is ionic, this is ionic, this is ionic, okay? When it comes to the covalent, remember covalents, two or more nonmetals. So number five is covalent, okay? So then I apply the rules. The first one, okay, going back to the different types of ionic compounds that I have. Let me just include it here. So at least it will be a little bit easier. to have so you are reminded of the different types of ionic compounds Okay, so if we look at one through four, then we have to tell ourselves, what kind of ionic compound do I have? The first one is going to be like letter D. Okay, type one metal polyatomic. If we have a type one metal, we're going to write the name of that element, which is sodium. And then CRO4 is chromate. CAF2 is going to be like type A of the ionic compounds, type 1 metal, nonmetal. So we write the name of the element, which is calcium. And then we write, based on table 6.1, the name of the ion that uh, fluoride makes, which is, uh, sorry, that fluorine makes, which is called fluoride. For number three, this is going to be like a type on E, okay? And as we've known before, okay, for the ones that we have type two metals, we have to break them into ions. So for number three, at first you're going to say, okay, Ni, CR2O7, if I break this into ions, because my CR2O7 doesn't have a parenthesis, this means that I have Ni plus one, CR2O7 minus one. Now notice that CR2O7 is never negative one, so that is incorrect charge. So then you have to erase that. You have to assign its correct charge, which is negative two. And in this system, you only have one of them. You'll also have only one nickel, so that means that we need to find what is the real charge for nickel, okay? So, in order to balance the charges here, nickel needs to be positive 2. So, after doing this, then you can see that the name of this compound is going to be nickel 2 dichromate, okay? For number four, this is going to be like letter B in the ionic compounds, okay? It's a type two metal, non-metal. So we're going to break them into ions. So number four breaks as Sn4 plus and Cl negative one, okay? Then we know that because chlorine lives in 7A, it is always negative one, so we can go ahead and name it. So this is going to be 10, for chloride, okay? And lastly, for number five, because it's a covalent compound, we have to think of prefixes. So we have two of P, so that means diphosphorus. 
And then we have five of the oxygens. We have penta oxide. But remember, because this ends in A and this starts in with O, we're going to erase the A and make one word. So this is pentoxide. Make sure that you practice how to name ionic compounds and molecular compounds.